Bavik wrote theology with the church in mind. It's one of the reasons you should think about reading Bavink, is he really wanted the people to live out the Christian life, his focus on piety. Hey guys, Joe here, back to the word today with a fun deep dive study video on why read Bavink's Reform Dogmatics, who was he, why is what he wrote important, and why you should read it. Gonna give you some reasons to do that. The content for this video is all time stamped below, so feel free to jump ahead to some of the content that may interest you the most. I'm going to do a series of videos on my channel on Herman Bavink and his reformed dogmatics. I've already done an unboxing. I'm going to do a deep dive into his bio and also talk about neo-Calvinism and what that is and all those links are in the description below. For this video, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover who was Herman Bavink, just a brief bio, three popular myths and Bavink's theology in a shorter work. Do you have to read all 3,000 or so pages, this is just volume one, of his four volumes of uh, Reformed Dogmatics? Um, this work of systematic historical theology. So I'll talk about that. I'll also say why read Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics. I'm going to give you the sixth reason from a TGC article and then also additional reasons for reading Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics. Just some things personally for me and some things that I found online as well. So with that, what brought this video about briefly is I bought the deluxe edition in November of 2023 of the four volumes of Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics published by Baker Academic. I've done an unboxing video already on my channel. If you want to go look at this specific volume, its contents, the four volumes of Bavink's Reform Dogmatics, translated into English by Baker Academic in 2008 when they published them, are just over 3,000 pages long. And so I just wanted to dive in. I was like, why would I read this? Lots of people have it on the shelf. And so it just sent me into this study. And I wanted to share with all of you what I found, not just for me to process it, but to share it and to help others as they think about reading these works, what their value is, and who Bavink even was. So I'm going to do this series of videos all linked below. Anything that I mention on this video, as you see the notes notes scrolling on the side, will be linked in the description as well. If you, I don't do that or you have a question, I would love to hear about it in the comments. So with that, this channel is back to the word. My channel exists to equip and encourage you to read the Bible good books, and have conversations that truly matter. If you like that sort of content, make sure you like, subscribe, so other people see these videos and you don't miss a future video as well. So with that, let's get into the video content for today. So who was Herman Bavink? A brief introduction. My notes are going to be going on the side and I'll make comments as I read them and share them with you uh, throughout. So Herman Bavink, 1854 to 1921, was a Dutch Calvinist theologian and churchman. He was a significant scholar in the Calvinist tradition alongside Abraham Kuyper, B.B. Warfield, and Gerhardus Voss. He taught at Campen Theological Seminary and succeeded Abraham Kuyper as professor of systematic theology at the Free University of Amsterdam in 1902. Bavink is best known for his four volumes, Reformed Dogmatics. I have there the Dutch name. Over the course of his life, Bavink wrote not only on theology, but also on Christian politics and education, creation versus evolution, psychology, and the family. He is best known today for being a premier theologian of Dutch neo-Calvinism. Uh, I'll do a video on that. I'll link it in the card above and also in the description for this video. Neo-Calvinism, first developed by Abraham Kuyper, is a flavor of Calvinism that emphasizes the sovereignty of God over every area of life and desires to understand what it means to be a Re Reformation Protestant under the tutelage of the Reformer of Geneva, being John Calvin, but in a different cultural landscape that Calvin never knew of. Then he even 
knew about. And so I have a TGC article there where you can go and get more from some of these things that I'm writing about. Uh, what about him, the man and the theologian? Obviously, I'm doing a longer video. that will get into more of these topics. So you can cue the card at the top and also check the video description. But Bavik wrote Theology with the Church in Mind. It's one of the reasons you should think about reading Bavink because he really wanted to people to live out the Christian life. His focus on piety right there. He prized evangelical piety. He did not disparage modern learning. He took a genuine interest in the world's non-Christian religious traditions as important data for Christian theology. Though he was firmly committed to the Reformed confessional tradition, his theological range was truly Catholic. He knew how to reap the benefits, the good things from the wider range of Christian religious orthodoxy. He says the greatness of his mind is evident. So that's from the Crossway article by John Bolt, who was the editor for the Baker Academics Four Volumes Reform Dogmatics. He's also the one who worked out the abridgment published by Baker Academic, where you can get the four dogmatics cut down to one, an abridgment by John Bolt. So there's good reasons there. Uh, next part of this video, three popular myths and Bavink's theology in a shorter work. So first, there's lots of popular myths out there about Bavink as I was digging into and thinking about him and different things. I wanted to talk about three of them. These come from James Eglinton's critical biography of Bavink. He actually posted these three myths on his website slash blog, and I have the link there as well. So myth number one, just as you're hopping into Bavink, you might hear some of these things. These are not true. So first, he was a diamond in the rough found by his teacher. Uh, this is just unfounded, as Eglinton goes on to share in his post, is that it's kind of thought at some point like uh, Bavink was bright, but was kind of thought to be not, not bright. And so his teacher, his high school teacher, or whoever it was, found him, discovered him to be very bright. Not true at all. He was always someone who was a deep thinker, um, very studious, learned. And so we see that throughout his life. You'll also hear number two myth that there was a national uproar for his transfer to a liberal university. So he went to the tr uh, seminary that was uh, to be trained in theology that was belonged to the uh, denomination that his dad was a part of. And so he went there for a solid year to have training, but he wanted to go be trained by the best biblical scholars, but also by those who were leading in the, in the Enlightenment at the time. And so, yes, it was exposing him to ideas of modernity, those who wanted a liberal theology, but he wanted to go there. And there's multiple reasons he may have wanted to go to that university, be it a church in that city or the education that he was going to receive, or just so he could grapple with some of those ideas. Um, but it, there's sometimes people write about it like there was a national uproar that he was leaving the faith and going to a liberal university. And while his family may have had conversations about it, it was not a national uproar like the whole of the church of, De, of the Netherlands of the Dutch relied on Bavink. That's just not totally true. Myth number three. Uh, some people will say, yes, read him. Read Reform Dogmatics. Read some of his works on ethics, the family politics, various other things that he has written about, but don't end up like him or take him too seriously. Many say this because there was a certain point towards the end of his life where he gave away all of his textbooks about dogmatics. Uh, he had taught for a long time, and so there's some who say he gave them away because he no longer believed them. Uh, there, you can translate the, same, translate the same phrase that he gave them away because he wanted them to benefit other people and he was no longer teaching in that fashion. So it's just really an interpretation of that. Uh, he also was very discouraged. This is true towards the end of his life uh, for in the Christianity as a whole. Um, this is on the, the brink of World War I. He started to see this move away from Christianity broadly as a whole. He saw some of the things that were coming in culture way ahead of their time, in all honesty. And he was discouraged about the, the Christianity that his children um, and the grandchildren of that generation were going to experience. So he was very sad about that. Uh, but that doesn't mean he left the Reformed faith as a whole. All right. Bavink's Theology and a Shorter Work. So I already held up my copy. This is volume one 
I have the deluxe edition. You can also get it in hardback. Um, that's the 3,000 page, four volume work. Can you get this theology in a shorter work for those who are not going to be able to tackle 3,000 pages and some of the most more difficult parts of Bob Inc.'s works? Um, for those intimidated um, by the four by the full four volumes, Bavik himself wrote his own non-academic abridgment of the dogmatique. That's the Greek or the Dutch term right there for use by churches, families, and individuals. There's the Dutch name of what it was translated as the wonderful works of God instruction in the Christian religion for reformed believers. This work was translated as our reasonable faith as survey of Christian doctrine and has been around in, in English since 1956. And that work has, is a gem in its own right, and it's distinct from the, and the abridgment by John Bolt, done recently, like 2011 or so, by Baker Academic. This is an abridgment that Bavink did himself. I've heard people say, you need to read um, Our Reasonable Faith slash The Wonderful Works of God, as you read the four volumes of Reformed Dogmatics, because he has insights in both um, it's not just that that are different and nuanced in a certain way because of their audience. The theology is the same, but there he flushes those out in different ways because this was written um, for churches, families, and individuals. Most recently, this has been published as The Wonderful Works of God in 2019 by Westminster Seminary Press. I have mine over there on the bookshelf. <sighs> So here it is right here, The Wonderful Works of God, Herman Bavink. So if you're not thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to make it through 3,000 some pages, but I would like to be exposed to his theology, this would be a great pickup and read just over 800 or so pages right here in a beautiful edition by Westminster Seminary Press. All right. Why read Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics? Here are six reasons from Derek Rishmali. I don't know how you pronounce that, but there's the link, there's the name. I think this was very helpful. He has a longer article. I've summarized his six points here, and then I'll go into some other reasons. Reasons. First, I would encourage you to read Reformed Dogmatics because it's eminently biblical. Each and every subject is treated by Bavink and first developed according to the relevant biblical materials. Reformed Dogmatics, all four volumes, is a work first off of systematic theology. He goes to the Bible text first and then he builds out and shows the historical theology methods. That's reason number two. It's historically grounded. Each section functions as a crash course in the history of the development of the doctrine. After a discussion of the biblical material, Bavink proceeds to examine patristic developments both east and west, medieval sources, Reformation debates, both Protestant and Catholic, and modern Protestant liberalism that he was experiencing in his day. All of the major debates are covered and detailed arguments for various historical positions are developed at length. And so you're getting a work not just that goes to the Bible, not just develops these um, doctrines or these areas of teaching emphasis and what the Bible says about them, but then is giving you the historical background about what the church and theologians and others have said about that throughout all ages. The third reason given in the TGC article is that Bavink is broadly Catholic. He's well attuned to the riches to be discovered across the wider Christian heritage. Indeed, Augustine and Aquinas appear to get more play in his doctrine of God than Calvin, Luther, or even later post-Reformation sources. This is one of the reasons he's so attractive is because not only does he know his Reformed tradition, he has studied well the span of the wider Christian heritage and tradition as well. Number four, he's a reason he's ironically polemic. So Bavink's method involves lengthy charitable expositions of viewpoints he wishes to dispute, Roman, Lutheran, Remonstrat, Socian, so that he might, by contrast, better develop the unique strengths and nuance of the Reformed position. So ironically means having a friendly disposition or disagreement towards that you're going to give people the benefit of the doubt. You're not trying to develop straw man arguments and totally demolish them. You're trying to present their ideas for what they really are 
even though you disagree with them, which is the polemic part that you're giving a defense and showing how it differs from what you believe the truth is and what you actually believe. And he does that in his Reformed dogmatics. The number five reason, philosophically sophisticated in the dogmatics, Bavink engages philosophical views on every level on a wide range of subjects. In this respect, he's like Barth, but about 30 years ahead of the curve. I'll talk more about this specifically in the Neo-Calvinism and some of the other videos, but theologians argue a lot about what does philosophy and theology, what's the relationship between them? What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem type of comment? And so Bavink believes in his Neo-Calvinist position that God's sovereign over everything, and so philosophy is a part of that, and he engages philosophical debates perspectives and things with a Christian worldview from the Reformed theology position. Number six, Reformed theology as tradition. Bavink was keenly aware of his position as a theologian situated within a particular tradition. As such, reading his expositions of the Reformed approach to a given problem begins to give the Reformed theological student, someone who just being introduced to Reformed theology, a greater appreciation for the tradition as a tradition. So that's one of the big reasons I picked this up is because I wanted to learn some of those things and learn what the Reformed faith, the Reformed tradition says about these different areas of theology. All right, moving on. Additional reasons for reading Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics. Those were six reasons from the TGC article that I thought were really helpful. Here are some other reasons you, I would encourage you to read do, the Reformed Dogmatics and why I'm planning to read through in a future year Reformed Dogmatics on my own. First, Reformed Rite of Passage. Um, Bavink's works, since they became available and were translated from Dutch into English in 2008 and published, really has become a Reformed theologian rite of passage. Even if, it, even if it just sits on your shelf, if you're a Reformed or Reformed leaning, you have Bavink, know who he is, and his books, his four volumes, or an abridgment or some engagement with them is sitting on your shelf. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted them. Also, the for Reformed Dogmatics is a high point of Reformed theology and represents a high point. It says Reformed Dogmatics represents the concluding high point of some 400 years of productive Dutch Reformed theological reflection. And that's at the very beginning of volume one. John Bolt talks about that on page 11. Also, we see another reason is that Reformed Dogmatics respects the richness of the wider Christian heritage. I've already talked about this briefly. Bavink studied and knows the richness across the wider Christian heritage and engaged other theological traditions in this magnum opus work from him. Also, it's going to grow your reading ability as you read Reformed Dogmatics, which is difficult in sections. You will have to keep moving when you don't understand certain things to keep different things. You might not understand all of his philosophical arguments. You might not understand words that are in Greek, Latin, French, other languages. But reading Reformed Dogmatics will stretch your reading ability. Bavink's work on dogmatics includes lexical studies in the original languages, deep interactions with contemporary theologians and philosophers, lengthy walks through the history of doctrine, and more. And it's not an easy read, but it is a very profitable read for those who spend time with him and learning what he is sharing with us. Also another reason to read Reformed Dogmatics has a unique scope. I've already mentioned this briefly. It's a work of systematic theology, historical theology with a tuned sense towards philosophical subjects and modernity slash culture concerns along the way. We'll get more into this in the bio video with Bob Inc. and talk about how he was really perplexed and tried to find a way to synthesize reformed Christian faith with our culture and living as a modern man in this enlightened world. And how do you do those things? And how does Christ bridge that gap? And we'll get more into that later, but this is really a work that covers the wide scope and is worth checking out for those reasons. Also, you should read Reformed Dogmatics and know who he was because of who he influenced. So one of Bavink's leading disciples was Dr. Louis Burkhoff, professor of systematic theology and president of Calvin Theological Seminary from 1926 to 1944. 
Burkhoff relied heavily on Bobbing's reform dogmatics in his well-known systematic theology, which has been published by Banner of Truth. I have mine over there on the shelf. Here it is. So here it is, Louis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology. And so he relied heavily on Bavink for his work there. Also notable people that were influenced by Bavink besides Burkhoff, John Bolt, Tim Keller, Abraham Kuyper, and Cornelius Van Til. Five more reasons. I we needed any more reasons to get into Bavink, but I found these online and thought they were helpful. Reasons you might want to read Reform Dogmatics because theology matters. In Bavink, we find very good theology. And unlike some theology that we even experience today, his work is grounded in Scripture as God's authoritative word. I would encourage you to read Reform Dogmatics because grace restores nature. This is a unique perspective of both Kuiper and Bavink. Both Abraham Kuiper and Bavink saw with crystal clarity that grace restores nature or that redemption slash salvation is the recovery of God's purposes for his creation. And they have lots to say about that in their works and in Bavink specifically in Reformed Dogmatics. Because theological ethics matters. A theology shaped by grace restoring nature, as I just mentioned, restoring God's purposes, naturally and inevitably flow into ethics. Bavink had a lifelong concern with ethics. Even his PhD project was on ethics. And so, and recognize the needs for a theology that opens out into or onto all of life. This recognition actually led Bavink to write a work on reform dogmatics that was not published in his lifetime, but has recently been published and is even currently being published by Baker Academic. Um, also, fourth reason, because philosophy matters. This is another reason to get into reform dogmatics. This is something unique to reform dogmatics. Um, Karl Barth, who overlapped with Bavink a bit, but lived longer and later than him. There's no real evidence that they knew of each other, but it would have been interesting to see them um, talk about each other's ideas and interact with one another. But Karl Barth, as a theologian, almost single-handedly brought down the liberal theological edifice, and his rich theology is deeply engaged with scripture. So good things there from Karl Barth. But a serious deficiency the guy who gave these five reasons talks about in Barth is his rejection of worldview and philosophy as really important for the Christian individual. The result is that theology in his tradition, that's Barth, tends to be kept within the theological silo and not tooled for or allowed to spill over into other disciplines. Both Bavink and Kuiper do not make this mistake. They let this the biblical nature flow into every area of life as part of neo-Calvinism. And so both embrace the importance of a Christian worldview and both recognize the importance of Christian scholarship in philosophy and the discipline of philosophy. And so you're going to get those things as you're reading Reformed Dogmatics. The fifth reason, because more of Bavink is available now than ever before. That's why you should read him. Another reason, there is rich gold stuff in Dutch Reformed writings, and now Bavink is being made available to us, and we would be kind of uh, unresponsible to not enjoy the riches that are there for us to enjoy. So just over 100 years since Bavink's death in 1921, uh, his work is surely better known than it ever has been. And so I have there a list of just things you may know and works. So Reform Dogmatics, four volumes, Abridgment by Baker Academic, and then uh, Reformed Ethics. There's two volumes out now. I've heard that there's a third one coming. So volume one, two, and three of Bobbink's Reformed Ethics recently discovered and recently translated as I'm filming this video in December of 2023. Third one to be published soon, as I understand it. Uh, also, our reasonable faith slash the wonderful works of God, his own abridgment of that theology for the family, for the local churchmen. And then secondary literature on Bavink and smaller works on Bavink by Bavink continue to grow. And then also we have a critical biography of Bavink by James Eglinton that came out in 2020, I believe. So we are have a spoil of riches when it comes to Bavink and we have no excuses uh, to not 
get into and read and see what he said about theology and the reformed Christian faith. So with that, I'm going to end the video right there. As I said already, I've got multiple videos on Herman Bavinck coming out on my channel. If you're watching this later, they're already out there linked in the description below. Go check those out if you're interested in knowing more about who he is, what neo-Calvinism is, and also maybe just looking at my unboxing of the deluxe edition. And I'm sure as I finish Reformed Dogmatics or different sections, I'll post video updates as well. So I want to know from you, as we end this video, have you read Reformed Dogmatics? And if you did, why would you what did you get out of it? What did you learn from it? Why was reading it important to you? If you've not read it, have any of the reasons that I've shared convinced you? Are you thinking about it? Or why do you say, no, I would not read it at all? So just considering those things, would love to hear from you guys. If I missed something up in the video, that's on me. I'm trying to learn about these things. If you have insights that I didn't share, I would love to learn with you. Maybe a favorite book, favorite quote, favorite insight, leave those below this video. Would love to learn with all of you. So with that, this is Back to the Word. Until next time, continue to read, treasure, follow the word. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon.